This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsilo. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here with Leonard Barkin, who is university professor at Princeton University. And as university professor, that means you can pretty much teach anything you want. So you teach uh, literature, art, English, classics, also the author of uh, a number of books. There's Satter's Square, God's Made Flesh, Mute Poetry, Speaking Pictures, Berlin for Jews, Unearthing the Past. And most recently, you've got this book here, Reading Shakespeare, Reading Me. And also this one, The Hungry Eye, which I loved because I am also someone who is consumed with food as I consume food. And so I also welcome uh, Leonard. Pleasure to be here. So you talk about this book, Reading Shakespeare, Reading Me, as being about a lifelong love affair. And I think you, you said it was a lifelong love affair with Shakespeare, but I think it's really more about a lifelong love affair with art, with learning, with self-discovery, with kind of self-creation. I enjoy this title because Reading Shakespeare, Reading Me, I think a big part of the content, obviously you dig deep into a bunch of different Shakespearean texts, but really the underlying theme of the book is how it's not just that art imitates life, but that life imitates. I found this really a really attractive notion, but I don't think it's one that it seems like in, in literary and artistic criticism, we, we kind of go back and forth between these two perspectives, right? It's almost like the pendulum just keeps swinging back and forth. And in terms of your life journey, how have you come to this position, right? There, there's a wonderful, you talk a bit about how in your early career, all the students were interested in reading literature purely for selfish reasons to help discover themselves. And then you came in with this professional view. You're the scientific detached literary critic, and you have to help these people understand things other than themselves. And now it's kind of like you, you circle back to say, maybe maybe there is, there's, there's an element of, maybe there's nothing really wrong with spending a great deal of time understanding the self through art. I think we teach people, and I taught for 50 years or 51 years, we teach people, we draw them away from the sort of narcissistic reading and say, you know, and especially because I work on literature and art made a long time ago. So the sense of distance is automatic and it, it blinds the reader that the things that happen in Shakespeare are not going on in the next apartment in Washington Square Village. So we teach them scientific detachment. And that's a very important thing to, to learn, but it's also a lie. I think we all, whatever level of sophistication, if we read at all, and particularly if we read fictions about human beings, that we are always there. It's, I'm always in it by definition as a reader. And my relationship to Shakespeare, which as I show in the book, goes back to early teens. And there's a whole story about finding a chair with a scene from Henry IV on it in a junk store when I was 14 or 15 years old and identifying the scene because I was already obsessed with Shakespeare. But if you live with, and Shakespeare's not the only author I feel this way about, but the most intense case, when I read Shakespeare or when I, my mother used to subscribe to Woman's Day and had it had stories in it, you know, in 1953 and they were crap, but but uh, you read them and you are in there. You are rooting for someone. You're angry at someone. So I feel we have to let that beast out a little bit. And that for someone who for 60 years or whatever has been reading Shakespeare, I think it's worth putting together the way I read Shakespeare and the way Shakespeare reads me. Well, Hence the title. Well, I mean, th this idea of story telling story reading it's a little bizarre right just purely as a psychological phenomenon the, the question of what ha actually happens when we read and of course i'm thinking about literature i'm thinking about fictions i'm not thinking about a manual on how to use your lawnmower or any other kind or a mathematical text or, i'm talking about fictions and when we read fictions we however sophisticated we are in putting them at arm's length we also i believe maybe not everybody, but I think it should be everybody, we're present there. That my consciousness, my sensibility, my life history is on the line when I read Shakespeare, just as much as it is when I live my life. When I meet someone or have a conversation or have this conversation, everything about me is somehow part of that conversation. And I felt it's necessary 
to admit to this aspect. It's the kind of naive aspect, but in some ways the most absolute aspect where you you don't literally believe that those things are happening, but you suspend disbelief, which is not the same as believing, but you suspend disbelief. And another thing, you, sus- you suspend the sense that it is merely a fictional concoction by someone who lived uh, 500 years ago. You say this moment when Cordelia says she won't play, says the word nothing. How much do you love me? You know, how much more than your sisters? What can you give me more? Says her father. And she says nothing. She, as I say, I, you always have to say she speaks the word nothing. It isn't that she says nothing. She says nothing. I am there at that moment. I am. I don't put that forward in a learned article about King Lear, but I am present there at that instant. And my experience, similar or dissimilar, obviously, it's vastly dissimilar. I, my, I'm not a part of a royal family. I don't live in the 13th or 16th century and so on. But if I weren't present for that, I wouldn't be reading it at all. I would. It would be like a foreign language. And why would I read it? The act of reading it is the act of throwing yourself into it. And my contention Maybe not everyone has that experience. I think actually they will do. Certainly I have that experience. And that doesn't mean I am paralleling myself. And I make a joke out of the fact that I am the youngest of three, like Cordelia, and I might be the specially advantaged child and so on. And I I bring all that up, but I make a joke. I say, it isn't just that. It's that I am present in this experience and it is reading me. And I'm writing about what it is that, Lear or Richard II or Midsummer Night's Dream, what they have seen in me, which is to say what I have seen in me as a consequence of the experience of taking Shakespeare in a kind of radical, literal sense as experience, as something happening in the next apartment, only the apartment is called a book and it was written 400 plus years ago, but I'm reading it. Those are people. There are fathers and children. I know about fathers and children. And if I'm not, in some sense, radically suspending disbelief, if I'm not present there, I I don't think I'm reading it. And therefore, I wanted to take Shakespeare, my lifelong companion, and say, what does Shakespeare read in me? And how do I, in, in parallel or in contrast, go back and read him? What do I know about Shakespeare, about his work from the line of the sort of magnetic line of communication between those texts and myself. And what are my experiences and what experiences of my life? I mean, the Winter's Tale chapter, where I talk about seeing the play with my beloved younger cousin who died in his early 50s, not yet at that point, of course. But and what does that, what was the Winter's Tale, which I always say to students, my favorite play of all, because nothing whatever that happens in it is remotely plausible. What is it that my real, such as it is, real life, that is summoned by this preposterous, nonsensical fable of the Winter's Tale? You know, and what does that have to do with this deeply close, loving relationship with my cousin and his untimely death? And how, do, because it's a play with where the dead come back to life, not available for my cousin John or me. But all of those things are present in this kind of dramatic scene that I happened. That's not the way I do all of them, but this one happens to be John and I are sitting at Brooklyn Museum, at at BAM, at the Brooklyn Academy, and he doesn't know the play at all. He figures out in 20 minutes why it's my favorite play, because he sort of sees me all over it. And he's an investment banker. And I'm a scholar and we are, the play is reading us as, at the same time as we're watching it. Winter's Tale is one of my favorites as well. And I didn't realize quite why <laughs> you helped me figure it out. But it's not just that you're not a king and that you don't live in ancient times and right. you're, not a, you're not a daughter. But it's not just that, that that's implausible. But the idea of a statue coming to life is obviously mm-hmm. super implausible. And sometimes the motivations make no sense in the characters. But nonetheless, they can move us to tears and distress us and so forth. Is this a skill? When we think about suspension of disbelief, you say that you take it to the level of delusion, right? Your ability to do this. Is this something that that can be 
cultivated. I kind of think it's more like the opposite. It's almost like children are born with this. That's right. And then if anything, they might have it stomped out of them. Absolutely. By, by educating. Even like the more educated you are as a critic, it's almost like the less capable you are of suspension of disbelief. That's exactly right. I had a lot of early reading, not not actually as a child, but much closer to childhood than I am now, of people like Besselheim and Piaget. I sort of remain deeply connected with the romance of being a child. And I think in front of Shakespeare, whether we're reading it or watching it, we should entertain the possibility that we are children. We have the same relation to fiction that children do, which is that they believe it. They take it literally. And that I can talk the talk about image patterns and stands of form and all that, but I, we wouldn't be there. We wouldn't be looking at image patterns if it weren't for the fact that the text involved has had a has the capacity to move us, to be real to us. And so I want to get, I want to reawaken and, and grant permission, first of all, grant permission to that kind of reading, and then exemplify it. Say, actually, it's not just a sort of one-on-one -on -one thing, and it's not just a narcissistic thing, though it is that, that it's also a channel of reaching the text in its most radical form and not stopping and saying, that wouldn't happen. Aunties wouldn't get jealous that quick. But of course, the whole thing is preposterous. People standing up there in Shakespeare's time, Hermione isn't a woman even, it's a 14-year-old kid. And so, I mean, the whole thing is an exercise in, in accepting the preposterous. I mean, any television, whatever, none of that is really happening. That There aren't people inside that box. Or, and so that Instead of saying that's given, let's not not think too much about that, and let's you know go deeper and so on. I'm saying, well, it's fine to go deeper. Let's accept that experience and say this is real to me, and what's real, what is real in me that is being communicated there. When of course, no, none of my experience or anyone else's, in the case of Lynch's tale, could possibly be parallel to it. So, is it difficult to simultaneously cultivate your capacity to inhabit the work? and also cultivate your capacity to understand what it is that the artist is doing and to put it into some historical context. Because one would think that if there's this tension, that there's going to be a trade-off, but you seem to be able to push in, in both directions simultaneously. Is that difficult? I think that's beautifully described. I think we've been, who are we? We professional literary folk and the students that sit in front of us are trained, and it's, it's just particularly we're talking about literature written a long time ago. The sur the surface cues <clears throat> of familiarity are utterly absent. So even to believe it at all in any way is a challenge. And I imagine many readers, viewers, and it not, it must be forgotten that in the case of Shakespeare, these are dramas that he wrote for the stage, so that at least unlike say reading. George Eliot or Joyce, we are actually looking at human beings in the in the, in the medium for which it were written, although even you know, we are mostly turn the pages of a book. But at any rate, we the answer to your question is, I think probably for me, I had to go a very long way in the distancing kinds of literary study. What do all the words mean? What are the patterns of thought? What does the sound? I had to go a long way before I said, all that, yes, but I wouldn't be there doing all those operations. I wouldn't waste my time with and my mind on all those operations if it weren't for the fact that I am drawn profoundly into the text. And of course, everyone, I mean, people are, that's what makes Shakespeare. They're drawn into a caring about Hamlet, feeling the pain of Richard II, whatever. We know we're drawn in, otherwise we wouldn't read it. So let me look at what is What's that drawn in part? What's what? How am I in particular drawn in? That doesn't. Not everyone's going to be drawn into the same things the same way, but it's worth reading the narrative of how drawn in I am and what it makes and what are the qualifications. How is it that King Lear, in particular, summons up some of my most complex experiences in regard to my mother and father? And the book is shockingly open about the stories of my life and my family, because I wanted to, if you're talking about King Lear, that's the playing field. The playing field is not pretty flowers and, and dancing around maypoles. The playing field is violent love, violent hatred, terrible, searing 
circumstances having to do with parents and children. I'm not Cordelia. None of the things that actually happens in Lear happen to me, but it summons up the most complicated and painful matters in my own family life. And Midsummer Night's Dream, different set of circumstances. Why am I the change? Why do I think I'm the changeling child? That's At one point you said de- detachment is a badge of seriousness in, in contemporary literary right. studies. Is that a problem? Do we communicate that to our students? Do we send a message to them that this is how you should be engaging the, the world of art? I think detachment is a good thing. I think it's a, as I you referred to it earlier, that I talk about, I started my teaching career in, you know, in 70s Southern California, as sort of already the voice of a New Yorker being you know, snide about California. I love being in California. But, you know, the sense of the me generation, all of those things happen anyway. And it seemed to me they happen. And we toilet train our students out of that. We say, you can't be that personal because this was written in 1600 and now it's 2022. But of course, it's ridiculous to think that the level of human experience that Shakespeare reaches any of the, any of these plays, that, that is really very, that ever changes. That really, this is the Queen Elizabeth, the first period of human emotion, and we're in Charles the Third period of human emotion. That's ridiculous. All sorts of instances, okay. but those these works wouldn't have the power if they weren't. This is a banality, you know. If they weren't somehow, they didn't transcend their particulars. I have to teach students whatever else I do, whether it's personal or not. I certainly, in part of my job is to get them past those particulars, them past the alienation that those particulars may produce. Part of the way you get them past that is for them to understand them. You say, this is a figure, a way of talking in 1600 about something that is perfectly alive and well in 2022. Mm -hmm. So you have to teach teach them to translate that. But to the extent that operation distances it and says, they're out there and we're in here, want to raise objections and say, in some ways, by definition, we are, if we're reading Shakespeare with anything like the kind of engagement that people have had that keeps Shakespeare alive, then there's something that isn't in quotation marks as quaint things that happened in the 16th century, but is happening now as we watch it. And that's why, again, why I wanted to do at least one play as a kind of I'm watching it, or John and I are watching it. This is in the present tense not in Sicilia and Bohemia, written by Shakespeare in 1610, but in Brooklyn now. And again, that's the drama. You can't say that about George Eliot. It's a different story. But these were written for that kind of immediacy. And I want, and I think if we're listening at all, if we're sitting there receiving at all, this is what is happening. And I want to give permission to that sense that I am here and now, and this is happening here and now. And I am in the scene. I, I don't have any lines. But I am witnessing these events. Look, when you were in a PhD program, you also performed in theater. You directed. You were a director, mm-hmm. and then later you did mm-hmm. some acting. Yeah. Now, if you were advising your PhD students, would you <laughs> tell them that seems like a recipe for disaster if you're trying recipe to pursue disaster. an academic career? But it seems like an, it, it was an essential part of your yeah. of your education and helping you yeah. to become the scholar that you are. Can you talk a bit about that? What's it like yeah. to be both an academic mm-hmm. and a participant? In business schools, we have people that consult in businesses and then teach, mm-hmm. and yes, but you're doing it in the arts. How, how has um, that helped you? Oh, enormously. I always, There's an anecdote. When I finished at Yale, instead of taking an academic job, I took a job as the director of the Yale Dramat, which is the undergraduate theater mm-hmm. organization. I then, after two years, wanted an academic job. And I asked my advisors. My advisors said, you can mention them. Downplay it. Don't make a whole thing up about, don't talk too much about being a director you know, and so forth. <laughs> and in every single interview, that somehow came up. And that was the only thing we talked about. And there was so much more interesting to talk about than my, my thesis on Spencer's Fairy Queen, which was, of course, a masterpiece, I'm sure. But nevertheless, the theater, they had been sitting hour after hour with students talking about image patterns in Robert Herrick and so on. And with, suddenly they were given permission to talk about showbiz. So in, in a certain sense, it looked like a dangerous move. And it certainly was potentially, and in some ways it was a dangerous move, but it 
ultimately I did all right. And it made me, it, it gave me a sense about dramatic literature and about communication of it in any sense, with or without literature, communication in the classroom, that these are performances. I don't run around in costumes and read long speeches or anything when I'm teaching Shakespeare, but that I'm aware of the performance dimension of being a teacher. I wouldn't necessarily advise anyone to do it, but I did it because I did what I wanted to do. I mean, I felt permission to do that if I wanted to do it. And now you teach a course, it's called Learning Learning Shakespeare by Doing, right? Where you have, you put on a bunch of plays in a classroom. And this doesn't, I recall in, in high school, we learned Shakespeare, but right. perform it. But that doesn't seem to be the norm, really, for you yeah. know, teaching of literature, English, theatrical content. How does that add to the appreciation of um, the work? Would you recommend that other literary literature teachers that are doing theater, if they're doing poetry, they should presumably read it out loud, potentially. Uh, if they're right. doing theater, they should perform it. Is this, it, why don't we do that? Well, we we don't do it maybe for good reason. We don't do it if the instructor in question doesn't is not accustomed to the performance. It's not accustomed to to looking at the texts as performable, ideally from his or her own experience. It's certainly not the only way I teach Shakespeare, but it has proved to be very exciting. And I should say, typically, the students in it are not actors. They're not planning to be actors. The my feeling that what I say about that project is, I mean, learning Shakespeare by doing is what it's called. And it's really a sense of you really see how they, their meaning evolves and how their what their emotional temperature is. And it matters less. Maybe you're not an actor in any sense and you don't you're not giving a creditable performance. But what happens in your head is that you're 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 impersonate. You are saying these are not Richard II's words. They're, for the moment, they're my words. And I often see productions, typically American productions, where it's clear that the actor knew what the whole paragraph meant, but not what each prepositional phrase meant. And that's immediately different. You notice with a certain kind of training in England that they make those words their own. And so we really do speeches. And again, it's one thing to, to do the performance persuasively to an audience. We don't have an audience except the other students. But to say, why is that and? What do you mean and? What do you mean of? Don't, I'm not going to stop until you make these words your own, not for the sake of an audience, but for your sake to say this pause, this contradiction, this therefore. There, what do you mean therefore? It means that what came before it was leading up to a conclusion. I know what that is like in my own speech. Let's see how Richard II, what is the structure of the grammar when Richard II speaks it aloud? So, I mean, I haven't learned Shakespeare by doing, but I've, I've learned it by by watching. Right. And I think, at least in my experience, when you attend a, a theatrical production, it's, at least for me, it's completely different than trying to read it on, on the page because there's so much missing in, in the page. There's this additional right. performative element that really helps you to understand what, what's going on. And if we if we didn't have access to all those theatrical productions from either going to the theater or watching it now with you could go to watch the National Theater no matter where you are on the on the on the planet, which is pretty amazing. What's different about watching a play versus simply reading a play? Obviously I'd rather be watching, but I also think that the experience of I, I want to give a plug to reading that into the experience that there's no one else there. I mean, maybe there's somebody else reading in the next table, but yeah. that I am alone with this text and trying to make sense of it in my head without the help of an actor. There's something to be said for that effort. And I think, in fact, the sort of reading me part of it is probably more alive if I'm reading in, in a book than if I'm sitting in a theater. I think that that reading it, don't knock reading it. <laughs> yeah. As far as what happens in a theater, of course, the text is narrowed down. Let's not forget that. It's narrowed down to a particular trajectory that the director and the actors chose. But ideally, that trajectory is life itself. It is the thing itself. It is happening for real they are sh- the actors look like a certain thing. Their faces are communicating a certain thing. They're, the way they listen is important. Novels don't have that. That 
their bodies on a stage, beautiful, ugly, fat, thin, whatever, their voices are a certain way. So it's giving us a reading in every sense of the term, an interpretive key. And it's life, which again, novels, lyric poems, epic poems, they don't have that option. This is life in front of me. As I say, I wanted to pay homage to that version and that's why I did the Winter's Tales as watching it. And what that sequence, it's full of surprises and questions and so on. And the sequence you feel is if you don't, you, either you really don't know what's going to happen next, or even if you read it, you're lulled into a sense of that it's happening right now. Of course, I don't know what's going to happen with Leon and Hermione because it hasn't happened yet. Uh, and it's happening now, not in 1608, now. Uh, and therefore, in Act One, Act Three hasn't happened yet. And all that sort of sense of the life of time in a text, that, that play where time actually appears and gives a speech, particularly chose that to think about time. So you described in the book how when in your 30s, you decided that you needed to become an art historian. And I really like this because mm-hmm. you described yourself as, as a kindergartner, right? 30-year-old kindergartner. <laughs> starting from scratch in in this new discipline. And now I think with the books of Michelangelo and and your other books, I think you're firmly entrenched in that discipline. What is it like? That seems like a rather, I guess, dangerous move in in the academy to start from scratch. But when there are insights, I think, that you bring back to literature from your study of art Mm -hmm. that that probably wouldn't have been possible. When you talk about art historians spend a lot of time talking about the canvas versus the thing depicted on the canvas, the fiction versus the reality. And I had never really thought quite that same way when I thought about literature, but it makes perfect sense to to see those parallels, right? The immediate impulse that led me into the art history business was a particular subject, the subject of, of the Gosme Plesh, which was the continuing afterlife of the idea of magical transformation or metamorphosis in the sort of myth world of the ancients that was then tremendously fundamental narrative material for all the arts from antiquity on, let's say, at least into the 18th century. And so I focused particularly because I had this great coup de foudre with Ovid, which I hadn't read even in Latin class. And so it began as saying, I can't, I want to write about a great Renaissance scholar of a previous generation, Kathleen Williams, whom I didn't know very well, but I started, I talked with her early on about this project. She said, anyone who figures out why metamorphosis was such a powerful thing will have made an enormous, important statement about Renaissance culture. And I thought, that's going to be me. But I couldn't talk about it only as poetry. And so I realized I had to absorb at least some parts of another discipline. I always loved the visual arts. I love painting. I can't do it myself. I just don't understand how it happens at all. But but I loved uh, Renaissance art to the extent that I knew anything about it. And so I I started to say, I have to understand how this works. And I just read a lot of a lot of great art historians work. And in particular, those emerging out of Abi Warburg and Vint uh, and Scombrich, people who had come to an understanding of art history partly through a very deep immersion in literature, in text, because so many of their the works they were interested in were, what else is there, were the visual realizations of something that had started life as an ancient, as a text in Latin, less often in Greek. I, I just went quiet and attended classes, but mostly did a lot of reading and a lot of just going around and looking at pictures and thinking, how do you talk... How do you talk about a picture? And how is that talking about a poem? And how is it not like talking about a poem? And, you know, and ultimately I became, I wrote the book, Me Poetry Speaking Pictures, about what is what is different about them or what, what, what happens as they're so often placed in parallel. What's that about? What is actually parallel? What is not really parallel, but heuristically or useful to, to place in parallel. And as I say, in, in this is in the Winter's Tale chapter also, I think it's there. I liked, I enjoyed the sort of social, the social life of the art historian was much more fun than the social life <clears throat> of a literary person. They went to more interesting places like Rome <laughs> and Naples and Venice, Vienna. They went to more interesting places than where Shakespeare lived. You know, big deal. They, there was a kind, it was a different, it was a different culture. And I loved that culture. It was, it was a more aesthetic culture. It was a more, in Italian, say, pleasure-centered culture. Or so it looked to me. It's a simple-minded paralleling of sexy pictures with sexy life in, in front of the pictures. 
but there's something to it. It was, <clears throat> there was a different collect connection among people. Once I started living in Rome, and I, I wrote a book about living in Rome, <clears throat> where instead of going going alone to read my book, I went with a bunch of friends to the to the Vatican and looked at, at Michelangelo. And the bunch of friends is an important part of that. And reading a book, it, it, you can't really have two people can't read the same book at the same time, but they can look at the Sistine ceiling at the same time and talk about it with each other. So it became itself a more, as I say, really in some sense, not meaning it in a vulgar way, but it was sexier life, more engaged in the body and one's contemporaries and friends and lovers and eating and drinking. I also wrote a book about that. So it was a sort of embodiment, which is a very important concept in, in, in The Hungry Eye, that art that enters the body, not just metaphorically, like through your eyes or ears, but literally, that's another order of the real. One of the reasons why I wanted to become a European historian was that I thought I'd get to travel and have fun, have wonderful dinner parties. And then I realized that, in fact, yeah. historians spend all their time alone in archives. And Yeah, I, I, I never went that direction sometimes. But yeah, but my experience of the archives my, was a wonderful one. The, my most intense experience was in writing the Michelangelo A Life on Paper, in which I actually went around and looked at, held in my hands, pieces of paper that Michelangelo, pieces of paper that he had both written on and, and sketched on. In the same sheet of paper, and that's the sort of the ticket of that book that we enter that. Well, in, in the Hungry Eye, you tell a story about how you had written about this famous episode where the La Oka on was unearthed, and you thought that as soon as it was unearthed, everybody started drawing, and then later you realized yeah. maybe everybody started eating, right? And that, that's a radically different interpretation. Yeah. You've written about food. You said that when you're introduced as a scholar and also someone who writes about food sometimes people would would chuckle why would laugh <laughs> never mind okay. it would be laughter it was like a comedy thing yes i've worked as a chef and i've i cook all the time and, and i don't think of it as as a lesser art form what, why is it that, that it is not taken seriously as as an art form is it just that it is ephemeral we write down recipes in the same way we write down music and those recipes can be performed a later generation. Well, um, What's the reason for this? I think I'm, I'm trying to think whether I had to put this, but we don't shit Michelangelo at the end of consuming him. Uh, <laughs> that's the way I decided to put it. That's a, that's an extreme and jokey way to say it. Food and drink are physiological necessities. And that, that sort of sits over the matter of taking them seriously in any way, even just inside the business of making them. It comes and goes. At the moment, we have, there's a lot of fancy, famous chefs and so on. It's been the case for 30 or 40 years, at least, on and off forever. But the people who cook, barring a few extreme cases, don't have the status of the people who put on plays or paint ceilings. That's simply to repeat the problem, but not necessarily to explain it. But it is a physical necessity. It is. It ends in the toilet bluntly again that was the the kind of bullet of hungry eye is revising a sense that high culture of europe say from rome to the renaissance included in some sense food but didn't put food on the same as the same sort of level of aesthetic importance as painting music etc literature and so the book is concerned first of all to illustrate how that it simply isn't the case, I would say, that there are many moments where food and drink are given that kind of worth, but also the sense of how even when they are pressed to the kind of sidelines of culture, they resist that, that placement. Jesus said man cannot live by bread alone, but virtually all the parables are about food in some way, or about crops that turn into food. The miracle is involves water and wine, you know, not better clothes. Or, or, I mean, that, that the place of necessity there turns quickly into a place of aesthetic achievement, not in all times and places. And again, there's no equivalent, there's no equivalent in the world of poetry and painting to what it means to talk about famine. We don't die from lack of poetry and painting, not our bodies anyway. But at the same time, all of these all of these activities, whether you want to look at it that way, 
all of these lofty activities, and that's really the thread of the book, turn out to revolve around eating and drinking. Early on, I talk about Kant, who is embarrassed by the fact that ta- that the term taste in any language, which is something that happens on your tongue, is also the term for aesthetic sensibility. And he says, why would it, that simple mouth feel? And he can't figure that out. And he's clearly, as I say, t- taste for him, aesthetic sensibility, the loftiest thing in the, in the universe and it's stuck with the being kibbles and sort of this sort of mere food, but it's not mere at all. And I think, why do we say no dis, no de, de gusti was non disputanum? There's no arguing about taste. What is that privilege about taste? And why is it again this tongue word that is this thing that that you don't argue about? And I think I know the answer to that, which is that that this that the metaphor about the works of art we love the most Mm -hmm. is that we take them into our own body. We eat them. And we, and the place where we experience pleasure at eating the first place and the menu is the tongue. And so of course you, if this tastes to me like chocolate mousse and it tastes to you like ashes, there's no disputing. That's a bodily phenomenon, but everywhere and in, in the bread and wine of the Eucharist. And again, that too is potentially the most sacred thing imaginable but it's also just bread and wine. It's something everybody can consume all the time with or without the body and blood of Christ. So that just trying to bring back a sense of how central to the operation, not only of aesthetic culture, but political culture, historical culture, and so on, what people ate and drank is. You mentioned that when you started reading Varberg and Vind and Panofsky and Gombrich and all those guys, you realized that your your religion was aesthetics, right? How did becoming an esthete be- become a bad thing? We don't refer to esthetes in a positive way in general in, in our culture. It seems like it's a legacy not only of Christianity, but it even is a legacy of Plato, right? And where, yeah. where, why is this trend still so... What, what, why don't we venerate aestheticism in the way that these... It's hard. <clears throat> Since I do, it's... <clears throat> It's not easy for me to say why we don't. Various things give it a bad name, justly, if it looks very elitist, even though all imaginable cultures at all levels of well-being have aesthetic impulses, it exists historically as something not necessarily available to everyone. And it may often characterize itself as looking down upon those who don't Share and I certainly uh, I avoid the term esthete. I mean, once you call it esthete, it's it's in the toilet. It's no good. But when you say lovers of beauty, <laughs> it starts looking a little nicer in the sense that that beauty comes in all forms. Human bodies, which don't in themselves cost anything, you got one, you didn't pay for it. From the very earliest civilizations onwards, persons were producing objects, f- seemingly for the sake of their being beautiful or being some kind of representation, not the real thing, but some kind of some kind of representation of experience of life of animals on the walls of a cave, whatever. There was a reason to have a set of feelings toward a representation that were partly similar to the feelings about the real thing and partly not similar to that. And that there was pleasure in in the sense that something was beautiful it was what it is it fulfilled its function in the world it brought us milk or warmth or whatever it did but it was also beautiful and it was beautiful in part because it was fabricated because somebody made it and the idea that it wasn't only nature or god that made things but human beings as well that begins to say there is a special validity in beauty. And that's what aesthetics is about, is the validity of beauty and uh, the study of what makes something beautiful or how to produce the beautiful, how to recognize the beautiful, how to take pleasure in the beautiful. Now, this, this is a position that, that is sort of juxtaposed against the kind of new historicism that was prevalent, I guess, maybe hmm. 20 years ago. What exactly is the key difference or disagreement? And, and how does this disagreement go back for centuries? You talk a bit about how this has been a back and forth for hundreds, if not thousands of years about the role of art in life. I come out of exactly the same education, sitting at the next desk in the same classroom. And I found it, and continue to find it, deeply revealing as this 
a set of questions about how it work, how culture works, actually, how it performs its role. I'm not a disbeliever at all. It's a false, it's a false dichotomy, in other words. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think it may have pleased people with a sense that they wanted to be on the cutting edge of social criticism, to look at these processes cynically, as though they were they were all some of the workings of malign power of those who had power, who are frequently indeed malign in their exercise of power, as we know as well as any age has ever known. But I think that sort of what's underneath was a very important critical point of view in regard to something that sort of took artistic operation for granted as uniquely about aestheticism. I find those questions add for me to the wonderment of the product. And when I look at, as I do in The Hungry Eye, some of these banqueting spaces by commissioned by famous and powerful Italian princes of the sort of center and north of the Italian peninsula, it seems to me the, the sort of political underpinning and the beauty of the result belong in the same argument. They're not opposing factors. I look now at that reaction as slightly childish, and I understand because I my education sort of spans the sort of before, during, and after in historicism. I understand that the that there were questions that were not being asked about how to who, how come they could afford to do this and questions yeah. to that. The fact that beauty was a commodity of power is to me both both a, a, an aesthetic matter and a political matter and you can't separate yeah so it's both and it's these are you right. add these perspectives to your understanding and make that understanding right. even richer so i guess the final question i want to ask is the title of the book is reading shakespeare reading me it, it could also be entitled you know how reading shakespeare made me right you yeah, I think maybe there's a it's in, in King Lear where Cordelia asks, right? Is he arrayed? I think you you quote that in the book. Is he dressed? But right. the idea of dress is also like the idea of culture, right? And we don't come out of the womb, right, with culture, and, it, and we build it up over time. So how does reading literature, exposure to art, shape who you become, right, as a person? And can one take charge of that project, right, like one would? build oneself a house or build oneself a um, your meal? I think why you do it is to recognize the hardest thing in the world to recognize, which is the rest of the world is made up of people who are different from me. <laughs> I'm not the world. And that the exercise, these exercises of entering into, entering even more deeply than you might have thought possible into an aesthetic object, whether it's a banqueting hall or King Lear. That's the exercise of saying, I am not the only measure of things. And I, I need to humble myself in front of, not because they're so great, but because they're different. I need to take into my being the other. And my choice, other people make other, my choice is great art. I can't make it, but I need to to embrace it and figure out how it reads me. What is there in me that has some chance of growth, of development, of responsiveness to, to this beyond what my ordinary experience gives me, that these things are fields of experience that, that I am allowed to have, say, by Shakespeare, not only as good as real experience, but better, more complicated, more troubling, more thrilling, that that makes me more complicated, better, more troubled, more thrilled, and all of those other things. Well, Larry, we didn't even get into the text themselves. <laughs> I highly recommend if you're interested in, a, in adding to your understanding of King Lear, of Midsummer Night's Dream, Coriolanus, Winter Tale, The Merchant of Venice, that was an eye-opener. <laughs> but Antonio, I had, it just, it, somehow went right past me that your interpretation of Merchant of Venice, a fantastic and Richard II. You say at the beginning of the book that you saw your job as teaching people how to read. And I think that if anyone reads any of your books, it'll help them certainly to learn how to read better, not just Shakespeare, but other texts, both visual and literary. So thank you so much, Lenny, for joining me. Thank you. 
This is Unsiloed brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories.